much as Christians to deny self. Why? Why is it such an uphill task as Christians for us to deny self? So this morning, what I will share with you comes from out of that searching of God's word that I did. Of course, it is not exhaustive, it is not the total, but the search continues as I continue to seek God and his wisdom and his revelation for this struggle that we have. And so I'm going to make this statement to you, and I want you to listen to this statement carefully. It says, I am not able to deny self, and incidentally, this is required by Christ in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. I am not able to deny self because, because, because I am self-centered. I am not able to deny self because I am self-centered. The statement continues. I am self-centered because I am not God-centered. I am self-centered because I am not God-centered. I am not able to deny self because I am self-centered. I am self-centered because I'm not God-centered. And hence, my topic for today is God-centeredness and self-centeredness cannot coexist in a person. God-centeredness and self-centeredness cannot coexist in a person or in a Christian. So I want to engage your mind for a few minutes as we try to connect the dots. And hopefully at the end of my sharing, I would have convinced you enough for you to join me in this path of denying self. In this journey of denying self. The definition for deny is to refuse to agree with, to withhold something from, to refuse to recognize or acknowledge, to disown or to disavow. That's what deny means. And of course, we all know what self is. Self is our individuality, our personal interests. We're going to be looking at a few scriptures in the Word of God. And the first one we will look at is that scripture I just mentioned, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And as we look at these passages of scripture today, I want us to recognize how very important it is for us to deny self. How very important it is for us not to be self-centered. Luke 9, 23 says, and I'm reading from the NIV. Then he said to them all, he meaning Jesus. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their lives will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit their very self? What a demanding passage of scripture. And as we look at this scripture closely, I want to draw a few things to your attention. First, 
the sequence of this verse, verse 23, is not by chance. It shows the necessary progression that one must go through. The first thing we are to do is deny self. Deny self. Deny self. And then, and only then, take up our cross. Once we have taken up our cross, we follow Christ. Now, if I were to divide this sentence, or this, this verse, I would say that the first one, denying self, of course, deals with the whole self-centeredness that exists in us. And the taking up of our cross and following Christ would deal or focus on the God-centered act that we are supposed to pursue. Of course, denying self speaks of our old nature or our sinful nature. That is what we are denying when we think about, when we talk about denying self. Obviously because it is this old nature, it is this self that is within us that seeks to dictate to us how important it is for us to please our own flesh. And so, the reality of it is that we will never Never, never take up our cross if we are focusing on ourselves. If we are focusing on our comforts, our conveniences, if we want to just do what feels good to the flesh, we will never take up the cross. Why? Because the cross we're talking about here isn't that nice pretty pendant on your chain. But as you recognize cross, in the Word of God, speaks to that very horrible and dreadful thing that Jesus was crucified on. The thing that people don't like to carry that is used to punish and to put to death criminals. It is one of the most barbaric ways of punishing a person. It was to crucify them on a cross. And so when we think of a cross, we associate with that word cross, suffering. Real suffering. Pain, hurt, hopelessness. So when we are told to take up our cross, there must be an understanding that this is not a sweet, as it were, picnic ride or excursion ride. This is something we were singing about actually earlier, about this valley where we are weeping. It speaks about the hardness, the struggle that a cross brings to us. Interestingly enough, you cannot follow Jesus and just sweetly go along in a merrily way because when you're carrying that cross, that cannot be your action. There's a war that goes on between the self, the flesh, and the spirit that wants to please God, and so it should be. It really should be a war. But our spirits must practice winning over the flesh. We must practice winning over the flesh. So now we have to look at why is it so difficult to deny the flesh, to deny self. And as I said earlier, the reason is because we're self-centered. A definition for self-centered, as I looked into the dictionary, it showed me self-centered is defined as concerned solely or chiefly with one's own interests or welfare. Engrossed in self, self-sufficient. I thought that was an interesting term because I personally don't believe that self-sufficient should be used to describe any creation. Certainly not man. But these are the definitions that you saw when you look at the word self-centeredness. 
Now I want us to turn quickly to our Bibles and we're going to look at another passage of Scripture, Romans chapter 8. And we're going to read from verse 5 to 9. Again from the NIV. Romans 8, 5 to 9. It reads, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit, and this is capital S, Spirit, so we're referring to the Holy Spirit here, those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Verse 6, the mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, and this is Paul speaking to the church in Rome. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If, indeed, the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they, can, they do not belong to Christ. This passage of scripture again brings to front the contrasting lifestyles between self-centeredness and those who are God-centered. Let us see if we can identify some of these things that we are referring to here that we could deem as self-centered. And so we will be able to list them as it were and zero in on some of the acts that we can, con we can consider to be self-centered. Let's look at verse 5 again. That's an interesting verse because it says, those who have their minds set on what the flesh desires, what the flesh desires. So what are some of these flesh desires? Let's look at another passage of scripture to see that. Let's turn now to Galatians chapter 5. And what I'm doing here is showing you how we can see the dots, like I said, connect the dots and see what are the things that we are called to deal with, the war that we are in? As we identify this war, as we see this battle that we are in, as we understand what it is we are fighting against, I believe that we will be more readily able to win this war. Galatians 5, 19 to 21, it reads, The acts of the flesh are obvious. So here we see seeing what the acts of the flesh or the desires of the flesh are now. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness and orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul gives this warning now to the church in Galatia. He says, I warn you, it's a warning that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, we can take this passage of scripture and look at the list of these acts as described here, and we can categorize them. We can categorize them in maybe three or four different categories, and for this purpose this morning, what I will do is categorize them in three categories. The first category that we will look at is sexual sins. Sexual sins. Sexual sins obviously refers to sexual immorality, which involves adultery, fornication, homosexuality, 
and let me say lesbianism to distinguish male, female, bisexuality, bestiality. You can add to that list pornography, masturbation. These things are considered sexual sins. And then you have, moving on from the sexual sins, religious sins. Interestingly enough, religious or spiritual, if you want to say that, spiritual sins, which I found to be interesting. But of course, the two that are mentioned here would be idolatry. Idolatry, which is the worship of anything or person except God himself. Now we know in a world where we are very materialistic, that it's so easy to be caught up with things. Things that, if we're not careful, we can begin to worship, or even sometimes people. And again, along with idolatry, there's witchcraft. Witchcraft. Now, what we look at when we look at witchcraft, we recognize that it's closely associated with idolatry is witchcraft. As a matter of fact, in Paul's day, persons who worship false gods would, would often times use drugs in order to help them into some form or some kind of trance during their worship. So we recognize that witchcraft and idolatry are closely tied. And then thirdly, we can look at the social sins. Social sins, we mentioned hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. And selfish ambition we must, we must define as a determination to succeed even at the expense of others. Because generally, ambition is good. But if that ambition drives you to a point where even if it means destroying someone else in order to achieve, then that ambition is considered to be selfish ambition and is seen in Galatians as a sin, as one of the things that the flesh does that we need to, to deny. And of course, attached there is dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, and orgies. Orgies, you could, you could kind of attach that to sexual sins, but it doesn't necessarily always include that, even though sometimes it does. It is just that whole aspect of wild partying with alcohol and drugs and all kinds of things. Again, that kind of setup that sometimes people get involved in. It is not, however, that Paul also, dealing with this topic, recognized that this list wasn't an exhaustive list, and that is why he mentioned at the end of it that, that, those, that term on that phrase, and the like. And the like means you can add some more onto it that fall into that category of listings. Everything that is mentioned here in this list of fleshly desires has its root in self-centeredness. In self-centeredness. It's all about pleasing self. It's all about satisfying self. And so, what should be our response? What should be our response to these self-centered desires? What is it that we need to do in order to deny these self-centered desires? I know when we look at that scripture in Luke 9, 23, it spoke of denying self. And this term, denying self, could be deceptively interpreted to be a passive term. But I want to assure you, it is not. It is far from. It is not just a case, if you could draw a simple analogy, it's not just a case of someone knocking at your door and you deciding or not if to open that door and let that person in. That's not what we're talking about here when we speak of denying self. We can deny entry of that person if the person is knocking at the door and we decide not to open it. But that is not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is for you and I reinforcing from within that door and expending every effort to ensure that that door is not kicked down, not burst 
and locked open. Because what, are, what is on the outside or who is on the outside is determined to get in. And they are doing it at a very harsh and violent way. They're not just knocking and hoping you open and say, can I come in? That is not what we're dealing with here at all. We're dealing with some desires that are pushing their way in, forcing themselves in. And you and I must counteract with that same force or even a greater force to prevent them from coming in. That is what we're talking about here. That is what we're talking about. Stopping that unwanted person or thing from breaking down the doors of our hearts. So let again, let's again look at Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at verse 6 and 8. And we're going to see what we're really talking about here in this battle of denying self. Verse 6 of Romans chapter 8 says, The mind governed by the flesh is death. Is death. Is death. The mind governed by the fleshly desires. That mind that is totally consumed by satisfying self. That self-centered approach leads to death. Nothing else but death. We know in Romans again it says the wages of sin is what? Death. So we can say then, that the mind governed by the flesh is sin because the wages of sin is death and the mind governed by flesh is death. Both lead to the same thing, the same and one, death. Let's skip to verse 7. It says, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. What a term. Hostile to God. Hostility speaks of enemy warfare. Hostility doesn't bring to the mind the picture of a casual or simple no. But hostility brings that vengeance, that anger, that war, that, that determination. Hostility. If you have a hostile person coming against you, you need to protect yourself because that person is out to get you. And here and see, this is hostile to who? God. Can you imagine that your flesh has seen God as his enemy? That fleshly desire sees God as his enemy. It is hostile to God. It doesn't think any good about our God. It doesn't care anything about our God. That fleshly desire that some would want us to play around with and be nice to. The verse goes on to say, it does not submit to God's laws. It does not submit to God's laws, that fleshly desire. And it cannot do so. Even if it tried, it can't. That's what I'm saying. So this fleshly desire is acutely opposite to God. It has nothing in it at all that points it to God. It is nothing in it at all that wants it to desire God. It is all about itself. It is anti-God, anti-Christ. This fleshly desire. This fleshly desire. Verse 8 says, those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Cannot please God. It doesn't say it might not. It probably wouldn't. It says it cannot please God. There is no opportunity for it to please God. Don't expect it to please God. Don't think that it might just be nice one day and please God. It cannot please God. This is what we're talking about. This kind of desire is what we're seeking, we're speaking about. And that is why I'm saying to you today, this calls for very serious and deliberate actions against our own flesh. 
It calls for serious and deliberate actions against our own flesh. This is war. It is important to note, however, that this war is against our own flesh. It is not against our neighbor, our employer, our employee. It is not against the man on the street. It's not against the politician. It's not against the homosexual. The war is not against other people. It's not against your neighbor or the one sitting next to you or the one sitting in the back or the front of you. It is not against that. That war we are speaking about here, it's a war against our own flesh. The greatest battle that you will ever have is not Satan. I want you to understand that Satan was defeated at Calvary's cross. When Jesus says, it is finished, he meant it was finished for Satan. Satan will never make you go to hell. He can't. He doesn't have that power. The only person that can make you go to hell is self. 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 That is your greatest battle. That is your greatest war. Self. And so, we must kill it. We must kill it. We must kill it. Again, we're speaking about self. That thing that wants to control us and make us please it. A gentleman by the name of John Owen wrote a book called Mortification of Sin in Believers. And this is one of the statements he had in, the, in that book. And I quote, Be killing sin or it will be killing you. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. This is not a passive thing. This is not a just sit by and see how things work out. This is you and I being actively against our own flesh, the desires. This is you and I warring daily at this process. Daily. Daily. Paul brings out another very important point as it relates to this war that we are fighting, fighting with, the, with our flesh. As you would appreciate, war would have soldiers and enemies, or fighters and enemies. But Paul brings out this whole thing of allegiance to the commander in chief. Do you recognize that any war that's being fought, whether it's urban warfare, which we see a lot now in today's age, where there are fighters and there are soldiers and there are different groups getting involved, that the allegiance to the commander in chief is important. When the battle gets too hot, if that allegiance isn't there, those that are fighting jump ship. They decide, I'm done with that. I've taken off this uniform. I in, in this battle anymore. I ride and I hide and I plane. I'm not a part of it. And Paul brings that out in Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Paul says, therefore, brothers, there's Romans 8, 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but not to the flesh, to live according it. We have an obligation. There is an obligation for every Christian. And that obligation is not to your flesh. Can I say you owe your flesh nothing? Your flesh is your greatest enemy. Now when I say flesh, please, I ain't talking about the skin and the, and, and the tissue that underneath your skin, the dermis, the epidermis, and that kind of stuff. We're talking about, you know, you know what your flesh you mean, right? So you're all the way on, on the same page. But you owe your flesh nothing. Your flesh is an enemy of God. So why would you associate with that? 
unless you too want to be an enemy of God. You cannot appease your flesh. You cannot seek to satisfy your flesh. Your flesh has one desire for you, to kill you. And so, Paul brings out this reality that there's an obligation, but it's not. It's not to the flesh. Therefore, we understand that obligation is to the Spirit of God. That obligation is to the Spirit to do what the Spirit of God wants us to do, to, to do what the Spirit of God requires us to do, because this brings us life. Obligation to the flesh will bring death. And interestingly enough, in that same passage of Scripture, we didn't read it this morning, but if you go a little further down, you will see the verses where the, 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 the God is, what Paul is saying, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that if you want to live, the flesh must die. Everybody wants to live. But if you want to live, the flesh must die. Because the only way you're going to live is if the Spirit of God is in you. And you're aligned according to that Spirit. So kill the flesh. The Word of God says in James chapter 1, verse 14. If you turn there quickly, let's look at James chapter 1. So we'll read it for you quickly. It says, verse 14, it says, But each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he's dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. So this battle is not against Satan. Now, I understand Satan plays a part. Yeah? He plays a part, but I say a secondary part. So we need to deal with him as well. Yeah? Because he brings temptation from on the outside and he tries to entice us to do certain things. But the reality of it is that our greatest battle is always with self. And until we learn to de de defeat self, we will always struggle to deny self. And therefore, to please God. So that is our focus. That is where I want you to zero in on this morning. Self. Self. Paul was saying in chapter, in, in verse 12, that we are not bound to the flesh. We are not duty bound to the flesh. You don't owe your flesh anything except to kill it. And that is what I want us to hold on to. There's no reason that we should hang out with the flesh. Kill it. Kill it. And I use the word, the, the, the phrase kill it, because I want us to see that it is an active work. It is not a passive thing we're talking about. It's a deliberate action that we need to do daily. The flesh always rises up into every situation and tries to push its way into our decision making. And so if we are not mindful of it, we will find ourselves giving in to self. And if we continue to do that, you would be in a position where you are practicing sin, which is dangerous, which is very dangerous. Kill sin. Kill flesh. Deny self. I want us to grab hold of the urgency of this. Because as our Apostle Paul, uh, Peter and our Apostle Stephen were saying a couple of Sundays ago, and we all left there thinking, yes, we need to deny self. We have to understand that that battle of denying self is not a one-off thing. You can't deny self today and say, okay, I've got it conquered, I've got it fixed. Tomorrow and, and in the following days, we go ahead and find ourselves, hey, self is there again. 
So it's a constant thing. It's a battle. And like the Apostle Paul said, he only said, I have fought a good fight at the end of his journey when he knew he was about to die. He understood that his battle with flesh continued throughout his life. And I will say to us that our battle with flesh will continue throughout our lives. It will not ease up. Whenever you turn, it will be there. Kill it. Kill it. Kill it. Self-centeredness. Self-centeredness keeps you away from God-centeredness. So now let's look at a little bit at God-centeredness and see what this is all about. And the truth is, I, we will never be able to de defeat our self-centeredness until we experience a life of being God-centered. And I, I brought this message in this sequence only because I want to end on a somewhat of a positive note. But the only way that we're able to kill the flesh is really by the work and grace of the Holy Spirit. By learning to be God-centered is the only way we can replace self-centeredness. It's like light and darkness. Once you turn on a light, darkness must flee. There is no void. There's, there's no place where darkness exists, where light comes. One kicks out the other. Light kicks out darkness. And so God-centeredness kicks out self-centeredness. Examples of self-centeredness as opposed to God-centeredness. Self-centeredness says, the less I give, the more I'll have. God-centeredness says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Self-centeredness says, placing self before others is wise. God-centeredness says, preferring others is wise. Self-centeredness says, do good deeds so I look good. God-centeredness says, do good deeds so God gets the glory. Self-centeredness says, an eye for an eye. God-centeredness says, turn the other cheek. Self-centeredness says, Hit your enemies. God-centeredness says, love your enemies. And so we see how big a struggle we have. How great a war we have. Because God-centeredness is not an easy task. It is going against our sinful nature. It is going against that normal thing that we will gravitate to. Satisfying self out of self-centeredness. Let me begin to close. The salvation plan, and I don't want to listen to me carefully, the salvation plan of God is a God-centered plan, not a human-centered plan. Let me say that again. The salvation plan of God is a God-centered plan and not a human-centered plan. Now, that might cut across a lot of our religious upbringings. Because somehow, somewhere, we got the impression that salvation was all about us. We got the impression that for some reason, God needed us in his plan. And so self-centeredness always took that position. It was okay. And so we often dealt with all the things that we come in to the world, to the church, sorry, to seek for ourselves. When we think about it, we, 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 we come into church and we hear all the things that God will do for us and this is for us. And, and so we start thinking about us a lot. 
And I'm always conscious of the fact that the salvation plan is really not about me. I know, the, 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 again, we painted a picture that the church is a hospital, a spiritual hospital. Can I say to you that is a lie? The church is not a spiritual hospital. If you look in the Word of God, you will never see the church being described as a hospital. The church is an army. It is always described in the Word of God as an army. Every analogy towards the church or Christians is a one of war and fighting and army. You see, if you think of the church as a hospital, then you know what? Whenever you go in a hospital as a patient, what it's about? Everything's about you. You expect all the attention on you. The nurse, the doctor, the orderly, whoever else comes in has to pay attention to you. And so you get there, you sit there, and hopefully you're pampered and you're taken care of well and so on, which is fine for a hospital. But the church that is referred to in this word as an army doesn't operate like that. You see, an army would have a sick bay, fine. Because whenever you're in battle, there's a possibility that you might get injured. Yeah? So if you get injured, what they do is they take you off the battlefield quickly, take you to the sick bay, fix you up, patch you up, and send you back out. Back in the battle. It's not a place to linger and to relax. Of course, if you're injured too badly, you know the next thing they do is send you home. So anytime you don't think you need to be in this battle, long self, God, call me home. But as long as you're in this earth, you're in a war. You see, again, somehow, somehow, the enemy has been able to bring us into this conviction that we are in peace time. So our mindset is a mindset of peace. You know, I find it amazing how we're always talking about the great blessings and gifts and rewards that God is giving us. Again, a soldier, when he's on a battlefield, don't think about the medals he will get. He only thinks about saving his life and his colleagues' lives. He recognizes that the, 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 the enemy against him is the one he needs to focus on and destroy. But we sit in church often and we, we, we have this bless me mentality and everything is what I will receive. And I'm not saying that God has rewards for us. Yes. And he's good enough to give us a few little things thrown out his side while we're on this earth. But you know what the greatest reward is? Your greatest reward is God himself. I often say to the New Believers class, if God does nothing else for you but save you, he has given you something that you can never repay him for. Nothing else he has to do for us, but yet we sit in church and we always think about what is in it for me. That's how the devil has set up us to believe that it's about us, self-centeredness. It's not about us. It's about God. Salvation is about God. I want to illustrate. Let, let, me, let, me, let me do a quick. I, I want three men to come out here quickly. Three men. I'm calling men because I need a man. I need three men to illustrate this thing for me. I have two coming. One other man come quickly. More males in here? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Stay there. Now, this, this is why I want to illustrate quickly. Stay right here. We have this image, or we've been painting this image in our minds, that salvation, now for all intents and purposes in this, in this illustration, I'm going to use Floyd as... He's on the right. I'm going to use Floyd as Jesus. Did I get Floyd? I'm going to use Romano as Satan. Oh, it's just an illustration. I won't get, won't, won't get to that. And my good friend here, Roderick, I'm going to use him as us, human beings. And we have been painting this picture that, step forward a little bit, Romano. Step forward two steps, step forward a little bit. You stay here. We've been painting this picture that at salvation, we stand here and we make a decision we have a choice. We are at the crossroads, as it were, 
And we are making this choice whether to go over here by Jesus or to go over there by Satan, as it were, and serve, continue to serve the world. And we come up with this, this passive thing that here I am, I have to make this choice between which one. I will either go this way and, and, and go to Jesus and, and be good, or I will go that way and continue to party and have fun and go with Satan and do what I want to do. Yeah? So choose, Roger, which one you want to go in. I think all of us would have made that choice, right? <laughs> good choice. Come back here now. <laughs> No, here's the reality. Here's the reality. Our salvation did not start like that. Our interest in the kingdom of God did not start like that. It was not you and I standing passively with no, nothing else to do but to make a decision if to go left or right. That isn't how it was done. The reality of the picture is this. You see where Roger is? That is where he, he was. Put your hands around, around him, Romano. Hold him strong. Don't let him get, I hug him up. It's not hugging up fear. You're looking to kill him. Hog him, hog him up, hold him rough. This is the situation that it was. You understand what we're dealing with? We were caught up in sin. We were held bondage by the enemy. Yeah? And this is what happened. Jesus went over. Broke the chains, man. Set him free. Delivered him. That is salvation. That is salvation. It wasn't a simple choice. We were destined for hell. Thank you, guys. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. You see, if we don't get that in our heads, we will think that it's all about us. But we were sinking, man. We were in a, as it were, in a torrent, wild torrent waters like a river that are flowing roughly down to the, to, to, to the rapid, and we were in there, and we could do nothing to save ourselves. But God, but God came over to us, came over to us, and rescued us. Psalm 51, 5 says, Surely, I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Understand that. You were born in sin and shape and iniquity. Sin was all over us. And as we came into this world, we came in through that process of being trapped by Satan. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners, while we were still in Satan's clutches, Christ died for us. Rescued. Rescued by Christ. Rescued by Christ. Jesus puts it great in his own time in Luke 4.18. And we all know this verse, or most of us know this verse. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. To set the oppressed free. That was God's, that was Jesus' task. To set the oppressed free. To break the chains that held us. Let me close. Like I said, we were trapped in this torrent, wild, rough waters, rapidly flowing down the mountain of sin. Our only destination was death and hell. But God, but God rescued us. God rescued us. Church, it is imperative that we be God-centered. We cannot continue to be self-centered and expect to deny self. You will never, I will never deny self if my focus is on me and what pleases me and what I find comfortable and what I find convenient and what I find pleasurable. I will never submit to God 
as I should. Pastor John Piper, I mean, a great teacher and pastor, he actually retired now from a church he was pastoring, in, I think it's Bethlehem Baptist. He made this statement. Let me read it for you, and I'm quoting him. There is a profound inability that comes from being an infinite or glorious God. There are things that God cannot be in himself as God. He cannot be deficient or defective or needy. Therefore, he cannot respond to us out of need for our value or our works or our distinctives. God can only relate to us out of fullness and self-sufficiency. You see the word there where it really belongs? Only God is self-sufficient. And self-sufficiency, and therefore out of freedom. And that fullness is the origin of saving grace. God can never be negotiated with because there is no value, no currency, no asset outside of God that hasn't come from God. And that does not already belong to God. And this reality of God's absolute self-sufficiency is the origin of grace. So here we have a picture that you and I are here not because God needed us. God could not have a need if he's God, if he's self-sufficient. So some miraculous way through his grace, God chose us. The word of God says that. He chose us. And so he chose us to glorify him. It's about giving him glory. And therefore, if it's about giving him glory, then he must be the focus. Yeah? Whatever we are giving glory to becomes our focus. So God, if he's in his rightful place, and if we are in our rightful place, he becomes the center of our lives. And therefore, we are God-centered. We do things to please God. Our life is about God. It is all about God. That is the requirement upon the Christian life. We were brought into a God-centered salvation plan. Let me encourage you to walk in that same God-centered plan through your Christian journey. For this is the only way we will learn to deny self kill self and so not be self-centered but God-centered church this morning we have two issues to deal with one we have to begin to unlearn some of the stuff that we would have learned earlier that makes us believe that our lives our Christian walk is a self-centered thing that it has to be about what pleases us and what is comfortable for us and what is convenient for us. It is not about us. It's about God. And so we stand and we have to be determined in order to be God-centered, we need to deny self. And in order to deny self, we need to be God-centered. So the journey is how do we do it? By God's Spirit. Through the reading of His Word, meditating upon His Word, applying His Word to our lives is how we begin to become God-centered. Until we start to make that application, we will not be God-centered because our flesh naturally wants to control us. Today, I want to encourage you. Let's not play with self-centeredness. Not let, not, don't let's play with the flesh anymore. 
the flesh is our enemy, a ruthless enemy, and it will seek to destroy us at its every opportunity. Let us war against the flesh. Let us kill the flesh daily so that we might live. Amen. Amen. I want to make an invitation to, first of all, to those of you that have never made that choice, that decision to ask God to rescue you from the pits of hell. From that rapid torrent of water that flows down that's taking you straight to hell. I want to open an invitation to you. It doesn't matter where you're at in society. I often say to people I've met that they don't die smart enough that they don't die intelligent enough that they don't die. Yeah. So there's a journey, there's a path that is set to us. The word of God says, is appointed unto man once to die. And after that is judgment. And so we need to Look at our lives and recognize we can't save ourselves. This morning is an opportunity for you to be saved, to be rescued by God. I want you, if you want to be rescued, to stand, to come forward. Now again, I don't go this path of telling you to close your eyes and bow your heads. No, I know I am about that. Because the reality of it is that such a strong, such an important decision that you need to make today, if you are concerned again about self, because it is self that will say to you, stand where you are, don't move. Don't, don't boy laugh at you. You can look like a weakling. That's what self will tell you. Because self wants you to stay there and die. The proverbial frog, you know that story placed in water and that water is heated up gradually they say the frog will stay in the water as the temperature changes gradually it gets hotter and hotter and because the temperature is so gradual the frog will stay there and cook before it jumps out and so oftentimes we think our lives are so cool and we're so comfortable with our life well listen the comfortable people too will go to hell if they don't accept Jesus don't play games with your soul. We read it earlier. What will it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul or lose his own self? What will it profit you? Today's your day. God is speaking to you. Hear his voice. Respond to his call. Forget the person next to you. That person next to you can never save you from hell. As a matter of fact, that person can't save themselves from hell. So it's not about the other person sitting next to you or behind you or in front of you.